All right, good evening everyone, welcome. Um, good to see you brave the weather and uh, I know it's the eve of the very long weekend, so I think many people are um, have started their weekend already. But anyway, for those that are here, welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Zul Morali, I'm the president and CEO of the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research. And uh, we welcome you at the Royals Conversations. This is a seminar series where uh, our scientists and our guests come and engage in a dialogue with, uh, with, with, the, with the public as well as some of our scientists. Um, so it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce to you to Dr. Benjamin Goldstein. Um, Dr. Goldstein uh, was the recipient of 19, uh, 2017 McGainslin Royal uh, Prize in Mental Health Research. This is, um, as you know, we are very good at recognizing our our star hockey players and stuff like that. And so we're very proud that McGainslin Foundation saw it fit to partner with us to create a prize for our young uh, research stars and cl clinical stars and of, of, of which uh, elk you have Dr. Benjamin Goldstein. And um, <clears throat> um, he'll be talking to us about the links between bipolar disorder and cardiovascular disease. Um, you might think that uh, these are heart and the brain might be very separate organs with nothing to do with one another, but in fact, nothing further from the truth, I think. Um, when you look at uh, cardiovascular, when you look at mental illnesses, um, we lose pretty well 10, 12, 15 years of our lives if you're battling mental illness uh, as compared to if you don't, don't have mental illness. And in most instances, um, it is due to cardiovascular complications. So the link between the heart and the brain is, is very strong and they are sort of uh, uh, comorbid conditions. Uh, very often people who have mental illness will develop cardiovascular disease and vice versa. And so it's important that we pay, pay attention to this area and um, that's exactly the, the topic uh, of Dr. Goldstein's talk today. Um, so Dr. Goldstein's focus is improving heart health um, for a joint purpose of improving, of improving mental health and, and physical health. Um, he's uh, essentially a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, a professor of psychiatry, pharmacology. He's, he is an uh, expert in clinical neuroscience. Uh, he comes to us, he's uh, got academic appointments with the University of Toronto, as well as um, with the Department of Psychiatry at Pittsburgh in the US where he did a lot of his training. He's currently the director of um, <clears throat> Center for Youth Bipolar uh, Illness, Bipolar Disease at, uh, at Sunnybrook in Toronto. So um, he, he and his team aim to um, deliver innovative preventive strategies and to, uh, and to help develop treatment strategies for bipolar uh, disease in the youth. And, and, to receive, and also as a corollary to kind of deal with the issues of stigma um, that are uh, coexistent with, uh, with mental illnesses. I mean, the, it used to be the same for cardiovascular disease, but we've come much further on that field in terms of stigma, but we need to kind of catch up when you have uh, the comorbidities. Um, in terms of science, Dr. Goldstein has published well over 130 scientific publications and has received international awards for his research. And today marks our, his first stop in the uh, arrangement that we have with the, the award, uh, that he's going to be going across the country uh, from coast to coast uh, talking about the research so that uh, the, the message and the information is shared across the nation. And so, so <laughs> thank you. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Goldstein.
Thanks, Zul, for the generous introduction. It's great to be here. I appreciate the folks who came out on this evening right before a long weekend. And also thanks for setting me up in terms of the importance of the topic. Um, this idea of going across the country and speaking about something that for most people is unfamiliar. Um, and they may be wondering why one would pay attention to this. What I hope is at the end of this hour, you'll have an appreciation of the strength of the association, um, how it may benefit people, and why it's important to look at beginning early in life. So as you can see, the topic, putting the heart into youth bipolar disorder, and I, I mean that in a number of ways. I have no financial disclosures. So the first thing I hope to do is talk about the strength of the link between bipolar disorder and heart disease. And when we talk about heart disease, we're talking about cardiovascular risk factors in general. So similar risk factors for such things as diabetes and stroke. Um, and then also think about how does this link potentially benefit young people? One of the questions I'm often asked when I present on this topic is, you're dealing with adolescents in a complicated part of their life with bipolar disorder, and you're shining a very bright light on a topic that's of great concern for their future health. And you can imagine that it's been a purposeful focus and that I think that there's a, a beneficial reasons to focus on this. Um, one of which is that we remain, as Dr. Morali mentioned, in an, a climate that is uh, constrained by stigma. There's been a lot of progress, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about why I think there's still a lot more work to be done in the area of stigma and the link of mental illness in general, bipolar disorder being one such example, with other physical conditions, I think stands to benefit our patients and their families. The other thing it can do is help us think more creatively and in different ways about intervention strategies that we may not be thinking about, uh, particularly among mental health professionals. So I know that much of this may be uh, familiar to folks, but just to briefly go over the fact that bipolar disorder, also previously called manic depressive illness, this is a recurrent and severe condition. Um, a number of psychiatric conditions are severe. Bipolar disorder tends not to strike mildly when it does strike. It affects one to five percent of the Canadian population depending on which subtype of bipolar disorder, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Generally speaking, across the lifespan, it has an equal effect on women and men. But in adolescence, as it turns out, uh, it's more common to be affecting uh, women. And we have a limited appreciation for why that is, but it also has relevance to this vascular link. <coughs> it's one of the most heritable conditions. Um, so if you have a relative with this condition, even a secondary relative, that has meaningful implications with regard to what types of diagnoses you want to be thinking about in treatments. And even in youth, this is not just a, uh, an American thing, which is a, a myth that has been um, debunked at this point nor even a North American or even Western thing. Worldwide, it's the fourth leading cause of disability uh, among youth. I think the symptoms of depression may be more familiar to people in terms of sadness, loss of hope, uh, guilt, changes in sleep, et cetera. But mania is something that I think is often misconstrued in uh, the lay press, uh, maybe less so recently, but it's important to note that not every teenager has bipolar disorder, despite the fact that many teenagers may have mood swings. And for us to reach a diagnosis, uh, we use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or DSM-5. And what it requires is this, a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, uh, accompanied by increased activity, and then three to four of these symptoms. So in mood disorders, we're thinking about episodes. It's not just whether each of these symptoms has happened in one's lifetime, but have they coalesced together in a manner that's observable, that impacts people's functioning, uh, and that is persistent in terms of lasting, generally speaking, days, but sometimes weeks. If you have these symptoms together that are on the mild spectrum, so maybe they're noticeable, but they don't really cause major disability, we think of that as hypomania. If it's severe, meaning that people have to be hospitalized or take risks in their life um, or have uh, accompanying psychosis symptoms, then we think of it as mania. And that distinguishes whether we diagnose someone with a bipolar disorder type 1 for mania or type 2 for hypomania with uh, alternating periods of depression. So you know we'll be speaking about youth this evening and the question is where, where does that emphasis come from? If you look at adults with bipolar disorder, between one-third and two-third will, will have had onset of their illness when they were children or adolescents. And the one-third is in the general population, so if you look at untreated samples, about one-third of adults will tell you that their illness or their symptoms started when they were kids or teens. But if you came to the Royal or to any uh, mental health facility, 
you'd see that there's about two thirds of people with bipolar disorder will have had symptoms uh, during their childhood or adolescence. And if that was the case that they had earlier onset versus later onset, pretty much regardless of how you define seriousness or perniciousness of bipolar disorder, it's elevated among people that have early onset. And you might wonder, maybe those people that have the most severe types of bipolar disorder, when they look back, remember it having started really early. But in reality, if you follow people forward in time, even from middle age, those who have early onset will continue to have a more symptomatic course of bipolar disorder. So it's something that appears to be inherent. An early onset bipolar disorder continues to travel in a somewhat different way than a later onset bipolar disorder throughout one's life. And I would argue, if you're dealing with teenagers, that it's exquisitely important to try to modify that trajectory. What you see here is a slide based on the general population of Canada from what was called the Canadian Community Health Survey from about a decade ago at this point. And so these are not necessarily treatment-seeking teenagers or young adults. And what I found striking uh, in looking at this study is that even though that this is a general population sample, not a hospital-based sample, it's very complicated already, even early in this course of illness. Comorbid anxiety disorders, high rates of substance use disorders, high rates of suicidal thinking and, and behavior. And what that means is that right from the gate, this is a condition that starts off, uh, even in the general population, in quite serious way. And then you look at the fact that over 50% of these youth had never had any form of mental health care, not therapeutic, not medication, and certainly not specifically focused on bipolar disorder. So how do we reconcile this pernicious, severe, multi-comorbid, complicated presentation, and people are not coming forward for treatment? They're making attempts on their life, they're using substances, but most of them have not come forward for treatment. My hope is that if I had access to data that was contemporary, that this number would be a little bit higher, but I can tell you from working clinically with teenagers that many of them will wait years before coming forth, and it's only at the point that there's overt signs, self-injury or that sort of thing, or not going to school, when finally treatment is sought. And we have to embrace the possibility that residual stigma, uh, the shame of these conditions, which can manifest in a number of different ways, but one of them is to uh, undermine the seriousness of the symptoms, to attribute the symptoms to things uh, that are generic, the stresses of adolescence, uh, parent-child conflicts, etc. So an example of why I think that there's still stigma is, um, and this is just my opinion of, about this being a reflection of stigma, but I got this in my mailbox and what it was was an advertisement from the provincial government, from the Liberals, showing that fortunately there is now prescription coverage for young people under the age of 24. And I think most of us would agree that if someone has a medical condition that could benefit from medications, it would be good that there would be universal access. I think that's part of our spirit as Canadians, uh, to have that as a priority. And I went specifically looking at this, thinking, okay, this is it. This is going to be the opportunity where there's a, a widespread public focus on youth mental health, because really, when you look at the conditions, medical conditions, that are functionally impairing, that cause suffering uh, for young people, by and large, overwhelmingly, it's mental health and behavioral conditions. And what you see here is free prescription medications for youth, including asthma inhalers, EpiPens, antibiotics, anti-seizure medication, cancer drugs, and many more drugs for rare diseases. So where is depression on here? And where is anxiety on here? And where is addiction? Um, so on one hand, I find it disappointing. And on the other hand, I find it really inspiring uh, in terms of continuing our efforts to make sure, not that mental illness gets special treatment, but it gets the treatment that it deserves in terms of recognition of what it is. So with that, I wanted to give a bit of an overview on youth bipolar disorder. There's been a lot of uh, controversies, many of which have gotten better through the years. As we get more research data accumulating, there's less and less argument and less and less debate because there's more convergence about where the data is pointing us. One of the things we learned is that you should diagnose bipolar disorder in young people using the same diagnostic criteria as you do for adults. And if you do that, what you'll get is a condition that by and large follows the same overall track as adult bipolar disorder with the exception of being uh, somewhat more severe on average. So what you see here is just a synopsis of data from a large-scale U.S. study that I was a part of. Um, three sites, 400, over 400 children and adolescents with bipolar disorder followed over time, at this point over a decade. The treatment was not uh, prescribed as part of this study. They got whatever they got naturalistically. What you see here is that if you follow people long enough, even children and adolescents with severe versions of bipolar disorder, 
the vast majority of them will experience a symptomatic recovery. And the way that we diagnose or, or uh, define recovery is eight contiguous weeks where that person does not have clinically impairing or life impairing mood symptoms. So most people will get to the point where they get uh, meaningfully better for at least those two months. And that two month uh, mark looks like it predicts longer, more sustained recoveries. So that's the good news that people get better, uh, but the reality is it still is bipolar disorder. So those who get better, two thirds of them, if you continue following them, will have recurrences, at least in this, uh, in this study, probably a higher percentage if you follow them even uh, longer. All of this to say that if we stick with our diagnostic criteria, with the limitations that they have, we still get a condition that looks a lot like adult bipolar disorder and that I would argue is uh, the same disease as adult bipolar disorder. So you may wonder how things arose in terms of coming to this heart bipolar link. I think that most of the, the vast majority of the literature of the data on this topic comes from adults, as you can imagine, because it's adults that have heart disease. Um, so how does an adolescent psychiatrist come to the topic of bipolar disorder and heart disease? When I finished my residency training at the University of Toronto, I went down to do subspecialty training in child and adolescent bipolar disorder at the University of Pittsburgh. And at the time, the chair of the department was David Kupfer, who also chaired the DSM-5 uh, writing group committee. And he had, a, he had a motto, which was, what does your t-shirt say? And this was part of his mentorship strategy, which was to say he had come across so many trainees early in the course of their, um, of their careers who had a lot of interest and a lot of curiosity. And it's really important in terms of his mentorship style to say, you got to define yourself in a way that you can explain on a t-shirt. And if you have more than that, you got to narrow it up at the early part of your career, or you're not going to make uh, forward traction. And um, he had published a couple years before I'd gone down to Pittsburgh, this article in JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is one of the top medical journals. And in it, it was an opinion piece, he talked about the unspoken burden of medical conditions in bipolar disorder. And what he told me was that when he sent this article in, the editor of that journal, who was his friend, called him up and asked, you know, what, what is this? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I can't tell if it's a joke or... And um, his point was, it's exactly why it needs to be in a journal like JAMA and not just in a psychiatric journal because uh, the, the evidence is there. People are dying young, they're having excessive rates of uh, multiple medical conditions, and there's not enough recognition of it despite the fact that it exists. So my appeal in terms of looking at the physical health, mental health connection in bipolar disorder was at the time, thinking back, this is now uh, 12, 13 years ago, there was so much controversy about adolescent bipolar disorder, and I thought, how do we validate it? How do we demonstrate to people that this is really bipolar disorder? And my thought was, since physical health comorbidities are so typical of adult bipolar disorder, certainly if adolescent bipolar disorder and child bipolar disorder is really bipolar disorder, we'll see similar signs. And so I started off by looking at uh, obesity, and that was, that was the beginning. And as you'll hear through the rest of this talk, it's gotten more and more focused on the heart and on blood vessels in particular. And then what you see here is an icon of, uh, of our t-shirt logo, which is heart bipolar disorder, which, which I'll come back to later in the presentation. What you see in this slide is the age of people in a large-scale epidemiologic study. So epidemiology studies means that you're not, uh, you're not picking people out by virtue of them recognizing a disease. You're taking a swath of the population that represents the whole country. So in this study, it was 40,000 plus people, but that 40,000 demographically, socioeconomically represented the, the whole of the United States, which means that we can feel confident that this really represents uh, the national uh, data on this topic. And it was a two-wave study separated by three years. And what we looked at was among people that at wave one had never been diagnosed with a cardiovascular disease. And we look at those people that at wave three had a new onset within that three-year period of having been diagnosed with a cardiovascular disease. How old are these people? So the first thing we found was that the rates of new onset heart disease were much higher in bipolar disorder uh, even significantly higher compared to major depressive disorder or depression without uh, manic or hypomanic episodes and definitely substantially higher than uh, for people that don't have mood disorders. As an adolescent psychiatrist, I was also interested in the prematurity because there had been some articles showing that this happens really early and as Dr. Morali mentioned, you know, 10 to 15 years earlier. So here what you can see is that not only is there prematurity 
of new onset heart disease. So people with bipolar disorder type one who had new onset diagnoses were 17 years younger than people that had no mood disorder. And the people in the no mood disorder group could potentially have addictions or anxiety. Um, and so they're not a, a purely totally healthy comparison group, makes it all the more striking. And the question that arises is, if it's 17 years earlier that clinically manifesting heart disease is being noticed, and we already know that people with major mental disorders don't have their medical conditions noticed as much, then at what point did this process go off uh, the beaten path? And at what point do people start having an accumulation of cardiovascular risk? And I would argue that by the time someone's a teenager, this is already starting to diverge. So the other thing that I thought about in terms of looking at this link, people talked about modern society, higher rates of obesity, uh, psychiatric medications, which I'll come back to. But there was a psychiatrist from 100 years ago, Emil Kraepelin, who had really an astute sense of observation. He had about 1,000 patients uh, with manic depressive illness, which is what they called it at the time. And he didn't have a conceptual framework. He didn't believe in a, necessarily a psychodynamic theory or religious thoughts or philosoph philosophical or anything like that. He just documented what he saw uh, without any form of prejudice or, uh, or lens. And so I went looking at his seminal text from 100 years ago, and sure enough, uh, he produces this quote, not at all infrequently, and in comparative youth, arteriosclerosis is present. A really a remarkable observation, given the fact that nobody at his time would have been thinking about this sort of thing, but also demonstrating that this vascular bipolar link predated all of the medicines that we use in bipolar disorder, let alone some of the recent medicines um, that are particularly likely to cause weight gain. One of the biggest accomplishments we've had, uh, I've been focusing on this topic for about 10 years, was that I was able to work as part of a writing group working with the American Heart Association to ultimately produce a scientific statement published in their leading journal called Circulation, which positioned major depression and bipolar disorder in youth as medical conditions that confer risk for increased and early heart disease. And I can promise you that it's not, it's not a quick process to have something like that happen. You have to be vetted just to uh, petition for submitting a paper, have a whole writing committee. All told, this took about four and a half to five years. Uh, but what it did was really place this topic of mental disorders in youth as medical conditions uh, on a pedestal, uh, an important pedestal that was long overdue. In this instance, it was for the purpose of uh, demonstrating the link with heart disease, but I think it also brings a much wider scope of focus on mood disorders in youth. And this was something that um, the organization that publishes this journal sends you some statistics three weeks afterwards. Within the three weeks of publication, this had reached 100 and over 103 million households worldwide, um, gotten coverage from a number of uh, institutions, CBC, um, Reuters, lots of major news outlets, NBC. And it led to a lot of discussion about mood disorders and, and why are they linked and, and having the conversation uh, inspired in that way. This was done in collaboration, fortunately, with a, a colleague, Brian McCrindle, who's a pediatric cardiologist at the Hospital for Sick Children. What you see is here that there's two tiers of risk. So there's a tier one, high risk, and in there you can see conditions that really wouldn't surprise you, someone having had a heart transplant or type one diabetes. These are things that um, are fairly obvious to us. But then there's diseases that are considered moderate risk or tier two. Those are conditions that you may or may not be familiar with. They're very real conditions. But I think it's important to note the fact that if you add up all of those other conditions that had previously positioned as putting people at moderately increased risk for heart disease among youth, altogether they amount to 0.5% of the population of youth. When you compare that to mood disorders in youth, when you add major depression and bipolar disorder, you're talking about at least one in 10. So if what you really want to do is prevent the onset of early cardiovascular disease among youth who are at higher risk because of a medical condition, Focusing on youth with mood disorders is a good place to start. The other part of the scientific statement, and this was something that had been previously published and we just applied all of the same rules to positioning mood disorders in youth, was that if you have one of those conditions, a, a moderate risk condition, and then you have a couple of other things, either a family history of early heart disease or you smoke uh, or you're sedentary and you have two or more of these things that you see here, then that person is to be bumped from moderate risk to high risk. 
So we looked in our clinical sample at the Center for Youth Bipolar Disorder at Sunnybrook and found that, at least in our hands, 50% of the teens that come through our door had at least two more of these other risk conditions. What that means is if, if you think that the youth that we're seeing are representative of other youth in clinical settings, every second teenager that you see with bipolar disorder ought to have their cardiovascular health attended to in the same way as if they have diabetes. And I think that's something that's really uh, not appreciated. And um, it's important to give some thought to what role mental health providers, uh, family members have in terms of drawing more focus onto physical and especially cardiovascular health. So what are the factors that lead to this? As you, as you could imagine, you're talking about 17 years earlier. It's probably not one thing. And I think that that's something important to embrace. A lot of us will have thoughts in our mind as we think about this connection, maybe jump to the fact that smoking is higher, that sort of thing. And really, it's, it's gonna be all of the above. And I'll show you how, how I organize my thinking around this. One cluster of factors that I think is important is biological factors. Are there shared biological causes of cardiovascular disease that we're also noticing among people with bipolar disorder. And you can see here a number of biological factors that have been linked both with heart disease uh, or early heart disease and with mood disorders, particularly, for example, inflammation, where markers of inflammation are elevated among youth uh, and adults with mood disorders, particularly when they're unwell. And those same markers confer risk for heart disease. Another grouping is behavior and environment. If we're sedentary, uh, smoke cigarettes, use substances, those things confer risk for heart disease. Having bipolar disorder is stressful. First of all, uh, living with depression, which can last for months, if not years, uh, has a, a biologically stressful effect on us. Um, it creates tensions in our environments in terms of our relationships with others. When people get manic, they can make decisions that even once that manic episode is over, they have to live with the consequences of those decisions for many years. And the bottom line is that people with major mental illnesses have a lot more stress than the average person. And then the final factor is medications. The reality is that many of our medicines, particularly for bipolar disorder, confer risk for cardiovascular risk factors, most commonly weight gain, but also for a subset of people, increases in their cholesterol or their blood sugar. And the bottom line is that it's not one of these things, but it's the convergence of all of them and the fact that they coexist with each, other, with each other that I think fuels the fact that we're seeing such a high rate and such a prematurity of heart disease among people with bipolar disorder. I wanted to put a fine point on the fact that the medication issue can be distracting. So the absolute reality is that many medicines most clearly cause uh, clinically significant weight gain in a, in a substantial proportion of the patients that take them. Generally speaking, about a quarter of a th or a third of people that take second generation antipsychotics, for example, will have a clinically significant weight gain, which is uh, somewhat arbitrarily defined as about 7% increase in their body weight. But I think that it would do an injustice to overemphasize medications because it would lead us to stop thinking about why bipolar disorder and cardiovascular disease may be linked. So I'll walk through a couple of reasons that I think are the strongest reasons to be able to confidently conclude that there's a link between bipolar disorder or other major mental illnesses and cardiovascular disease that's not fully explained, uh, maybe exacerbated by, but not fully explained by medicines. So the first is that we know that medications may, incre may increase cardiovascular risk factors, but we also know that the link between bipolar disorder and heart disease is over and above what we can explain by things like smoking and hypertension. The second is, as you saw from Dr. Crapeland, and there's also other data, particularly from Scandinavian countries, showing that we know about this link from years preceding the advent of any medications, but especially those medications that are um, the worst offenders in relation to weight gain. So it predated those. And then, fortunately, from the perspective of being able to support um, our confidence in this topic, but unfortunately, because of the stigma reasons that I mentioned, the vast majority of people with bipolar disorder in the general population do not get treated with mood stabilizing medication. Um, so a substantial proportion of them will get no medication whatsoever. And then only a small minority, about 10%, will have uh, medication treatments that would be concordant with guidelines that we recommend. And, it's, and in those groups, even if you look at populations that are 90% completely untreated, you see, that's where the data that I showed you, that 17 year prematurity, comes from almost exclusively untreated sample. So altogether, it's not to minimize the importance 
of staying focused on medicines that are uh, as good as possible for our physical health while maintaining the fact that really their primary purpose there is to make people's emotions better. Um, so we have to keep on focusing on limiting the impact that medicines have on heart risk, but that's not the whole story. So another question that you may be thinking about is, this makes a lot of sense from a physical health perspective, but this is a mental health center and what does this have to do with mental health? The answer is that if you look at various cardiovascular risk factors, whether that's diabetes or obesity or a conglomeration of multiple cardiovascular risk factors, they're consistently linked with more severe and more pernicious forms of major mental illnesses and particularly bipolar disorder. And one example would be suicide attempts. It's been a highly replicated finding that obesity is associated with higher rates of suicide attempts. We have a limited understanding of the mechanism, how those two things are linked, but the fact that they're linked is, is very well known and very well established. It's true in clinical samples and population samples. It's true in young people. It's true in older people. And so the question arises, you know, this may not be causal, but what would happen if people's physical health got better? Could there potentially be benefits along all of the points that are on this slide? And that's a question that remains largely untested so far. And I think if we forecast over the next decade or two, what sorts of things we could do that would be revolutionary or radical um, that would not require experimental medications, but rather experimental applications of medications, meaning thinking of medicine and psychological treatments with the explicit target of physical health is something that could be beneficial. So with that introduction to the heart bipolar link, I wanted to walk you through a number of the research findings that we've had that I think were some of the things that were recognized with the Royal Mark Gainsland Award, and to try to convey to you how we could potentially look at young people in a way that provides us a silver lining. So what's my dream in doing this type of research? My dream is that the same teenagers that I see who are participating in our studies will help us produce information that by the time they get to middle age, when, they're, when they would otherwise be getting premature heart disease, it could potentially be benefiting them within their own lifetime. So that, that to me would be the ultimate uh, manifestation of success. But in the meantime, I think that there can be a lot of uh, insights into what causes this disease and its links with, um, with heart disease. So the average person with bipolar disorder in most studies is 40, 45, 50 years old. They've had the disease for 20, 30 years and it becomes very difficult to separate what's caused by bipolar disorder, what's caused by the treatments of bipolar disorder. And when we focus on teenagers, we know that although they already have the disease, it's only one, two, or three years in, generally speaking. And so the, the nature of the relationship is uh, less obscured by other factors. What you see here is something that was inspired by literature in geriatric patients or elderly patients with stroke and dementia, which is there's a whole concept and even conferences on what's called VASCOG, the vascular cognition link. The idea that um, your blood vessel health, cardiovascular risk factors are relevant to um, attention, to memory, to cognitive flexibility, and lots of tasks that our brain is responsible for that are especially important in terms of the judgment that is part and parcel of being a human. So in this study, what we looked at was a task, computer-based task of cognitive flexibility. So well, the way I would explain it as being clinically relevant or relevant in real life is, in life there's times where you do a certain thing and that leads to good things in your life. And then the situation changes. Either um, you're dealing with a different person or the context has changed. And you have to adapt to the fact that things have moved along and change what you do. And in this task, what happens is people are rewarded for choosing a specific answer on the task. But then without signaling to the participant, the rules change and they have to learn implicitly from trial and error that the rules have changed behind the scenes and start responding with a different answer. And the number of errors it takes before you figure that out is a proxy for cognitive or mental flexibility. And what we see, first of all, is that teenagers with bipolar disorder have reduced cognitive flexibility, and that's true whether they're within a mood episode or even when they're not within a mood episode. So it's one of those types of cognitive problems that causes difficulty for people throughout their life. What you see here in green is the teenagers with bipolar disorder mapped the cognitive flexibility against their levels of triglycerides, which is a type of cholesterol thought of as being an early marker of insulin resistance. So potentially a pre-pre-diabetes, I mean, I think that that's overstating it, but the bottom line is it's a type of cholesterol that's clinically uh, meaningful. So the higher their cholesterol levels, their triglyceride levels, the worse their cognitive flexibility. If you look at the teenagers without bipolar disorder, 
what you see is that there's uh, no significant relationship, and in this instance, really no relationship to speak of at all, between their triglyceride levels and their cognitive flexibility. So what's going on differently for the teens with bipolar disorder? You know, you have to speculate because we don't have longitudinal or prospective data on them. But my guess would be that there's something protective about health. And if you happen to be a young person that has high triglycerides, you're otherwise pretty healthy. And there's a lot of compensatory systems that are in place to keep that high triglyceride from having a negative effect on your thinking. But if you have bipolar disorder, now you have what I would consider a double hit. You have bipolar disorder, its effect on you, plus the triglycerides. And you begin to see a, a pairing, an association between mental flexibility and triglycerides. And this is just one example. We see similar types of patterns with other tests, such as tests related to impulsivity, uh, making big gambling decisions, um, and blood pressure and, and body mass index. And this work was led by uh, Dr. Melanie Nyberg, um, who at the time was a PhD student with us. What's another example of uh, the link between physical and mental health? So we looked at data, again, borrowing from adults. There have been a number of studies linking brain structure with body mass index, which is a rough proxy for obesity. It's a relationship between height and weight, um, primarily. And what you can see here depicted in blue, again, are the teenagers with bipolar disorder. OFC is orbital frontal cortex. It's a front part of the brain that's responsible for decision making. Um, and this is just one example. There are a number of other regions, particularly regions in the front parts of the brain, which is really where bipolar disorder has its greatest impact. And those happen to be the regions that are most responsible for what's called executive function or executive control. How do you inhibit an impulse? How do you self-monitor? How do you plan ahead? All of these tasks that are so important throughout the lifespan, but particularly during adolescence when impulsivity is higher. And what you can see here is the higher the body mass index for the teens with bipolar disorder, the smaller the volume of their orbital frontal cortex. Now this is a cross-sectional study. We don't know which one came first, um, but we, what we know is we don't see the same relationship in the teenagers that are healthy. Um, you may see faintly that the red dotted line um, goes in the opposite direction, but statistically it's not a strong relationship in the healthy teens, whereas it's a robust relationship in the teens with bipolar disorder. And it's not a fluke, so in this example from this slide, we chose a specific region because that region had been linked with obesity in prior studies. Um, so that's what's called a hypothesis-driven approach. But another approach that you can take is look at the entire brain and look for areas where there's a different relationship between body mass index and structure in the teens with and without bipolar disorder. And so that's um, what we call data-driven. So without a hypothesis, just looking across the whole board. And uh, exclusively, there's a number of regions that came up that were significant, all of them in the direction of body mass index being related to smaller volume or smaller thickness and always with a stronger relationship in the teens with bipolar disorder. What do we conclude from that is primarily that this is something that exists across the lifespan and again just reiterates the fact, uh, as Dr. Morali said, that heart or, or cardiovascular risk factors in brain, not only are they connected at the, at the end stage of life, but they're also already connected among people that are at an average age of 16, 16 and a half years old. And this work was led um, by Alvi Islam, who was a master's student at the time, now a medical student. So with that, I wanted to shift to some research that we've been doing on exercise, because as you may be imagining, one of the things that you can do that's good for your mental health and good for your physical health is exercise. And um, as a first step, what we did was look at a clinical sample of teens with bipolar disorder compared to healthy teens and what their physical activity was like. And we looked at a very brief and quick screener that was endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics that looks at three types of physical activity. One is uh, working out, so this is moderate to vigorous physical activity. This is activity where you'll be sweating, breathing heavily. It's um, cardio or cardiorespiratory exercise. And there's benchmarks for that. You're supposed to be doing it four times a week at a minimum of 40 minutes. And the question is which percentage of teens with and without bipolar disorder met all these different benchmarks. So the other benchmark is relating to working in. That's what I would call incidental physical activity, taking the stairs, walking, gardening, that sort of thing. There's the expectation or the goal that people be doing that at least an hour a day. And then sedentary activity involving the target of not uh, sitting for more than two hours. And as you can see, whether you have bipolar disorder or don't, most of these teens are not um, coming close to meeting the benchmark. So I think that's 
an overall problem for our contemporary society. But the area where the teens with bipolar disorder are really lagging is in moderate and vigorous physical activity, cardiorespiratory activity. So it's only one in 20 teens with bipolar disorder that meet the recommended guidelines for, for physical activity. And when you take that into account, alongside all of the links that we've been talking about between physical health and cardiovascular health, what you see is really a missed opportunity for a dual potential benefit. In this slide, what I have is just the titles from four different review articles. And all those review articles are they're really elegant, uh, thoughtful pieces where people are thinking about what are the potential applications of exercise as a treatment, what are the biological factors that connect the effects of exercise with bipolar disorder, inflammation, blood flow in the brain, and that sort of thing. Um, if you look at the world literature up until this point, the number of studies in bipolar disorder for whom the specific purpose was to improve aerobic fitness among people with bipolar disorder is zero. So there's been no completed studies on this topic, which is really, I think, remarkable. And despite all of the potential biological connections, I think it's really important that we now start moving forward toward the concept of exercise as a medicine, which means looking at it rigorously and not just, a, not just thinking, we know everything we need to know about exercise, we know it's good for us. Really, there's a lot of detail, and I'll, and I'll come back to some of those in a moment. So as a first step, what we did was ask the question, what does one session of moderate aerobic exercise do to emotions, to brain function, among teenagers with and without bipolar disorder? And in this study, this was funded by the Ontario Mental Health Foundation, which is now defunct, but was really um, seminal for my own career and for a lot of other Ontario uh, mental health researchers to get things started. So we had four years of support from that agency. And we asked the question, what does exercise do? One session of it. We had teenagers come in. They completed a magnetic resonance imaging or an MRI, an hour in the MRI doing a task, looking at different aspects of brain physiology. On the same day, they would then go to an exercise bike in our facility. And be, uh, they'd spend five minutes warming up and then 20 minutes working out. So 70% of aerobic maximum, which is something that you'd definitely be sweating but not uh, uncomfortable. Then they would dry off and we'd have them accompany them back to the scanner and they'd do the exact same hour in the scanner again. So the first thing that may surprise you is that we were able to get 100 teenagers to do this. And I think part of it is uh, the idea resonated with them. Um, and the other thing that was surprising, I mean, we thought we would be able to do it because it's one session, but uh, you know, some of the critics of uh, earlier versions of, the, of, these, uh, of this grant was that we wouldn't be able to get people to get to that 70% where they're sweating. And, and we were able to get um, not, over 90% of these teenagers within a couple of percentage points of 70% for the, for the entire 20 minutes. So what you see here for the rest of uh, the slides that deal with this study is a true reflection of people having gotten to the target of their heart rate. And everybody was getting the same intensity of exercise. So one question people often ask is, well, what if someone's in good shape and someone else is in bad shape? Well, then the person in good shape is going to be pedaling a lot harder to get to the same heart rate. But from a heart perspective, everybody's putting in the same effort. So how does it affect their mood? We looked at a questionnaire called the Exercise Induced Feelings Inventory, and that questionnaire has a number of different um, domains. One domain is, they call it positive engagement. And the questions or the items that load onto the domain are such things as, I feel pleasant, I feel happy, I feel peaceful. So very much emotional experiences. And then another domain is called uh, revitalization. And these were, um, these were symptoms such as, I feel refreshed, I feel energized, more a physical experience of emotion rather than um, kind of a mood aspect of emotion. What you can see here is that if you look at the teens with bipolar disorder in blue and the healthy control teens, um, both of them had a physical experience of feeling refreshed or energized from the exercise. So the, the D that you see along uh, the left there is what's called an effect size. And when you see an effect size of about 0.4, what that means is the impact or the size of that difference is clinically meaningful. Um, and so what you see is a clinically meaningful improvement from uh, pre to post exercise in terms of how refreshed or energized somebody feels that's no different between the teens with and without bipolar disorder. But where the teens with bipolar disorder lag is those positive feelings of feeling peaceful and happy. 
the healthy teens came out of the scanner and they felt really happy with their mood and it was boosted compared to when they uh, had preceded the exercise. Whereas, as you can see from an effect size of about 0.15, that's not something we would usually consider uh, clinically significant. And so the question is, why aren't they having that positive benefit? And the other thing is, it alerts us to one of the factors that may explain why they're not doing this type of exercise. Imagine you do all the expenditure of that energy, you're tired, you're sweating, you finish and you don't have that buzz that people talk about after exercise. Are you gonna do it again? Less likely. What you see in this slide, and I'll just walk you through it, is the results of a task of response inhibition. So the person goes in the scanner and they can see a screen from inside the scanner and numbers are flashing in rapid sequence and they have a trigger button in the scanner with them. And they're instructed to press the button each time they see a number as fast as they can, except if they see a three, they're to inhibit that response. So this is called a go, no go task. And so as you can imagine, you're seeing numbers one through nine in random order. People are going as quick as they can, and it's only occasionally that a three pops up and it becomes difficult to inhibit that impulse. And actually both the teens with and without bipolar disorder only, got, only were able to hit the brakes 50% of the time, which I think tells you that it was a challenging task. Uh, we were more interested in what the brain did when the person made an error. So what we found was when the teens that were healthy made an error, a region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is an area that's uh, responsible in part for processing reward and the emotional meaning of reward, uh, they had a robust activation of that region. So the healthy teen presses the button after they saw three, let's say, um, to be generous, they realize that they made the error at a brain level and their nucleus accumbens activates. You probably can't see it, but there's just like a millimeter of line for the teens with bipolar disorder. They, they didn't have that activation. So they failed to, at a neurophysiological level, have the recognition that they had made an error. What was interesting was the extent to which they were hypoactive or unreactive was directly related to how depressed that teenager with bipolar disorder was. So what you see with the red line is, uh, sorry, with the red dotted line, is the relationship between depression symptoms and activation in that brain region. The more depressed the teenager was moving towards the right, the less reactive their brain was to having, having made an error. In contrast, what you see with the red line that's solid is those same teenagers after exercise, where there is no longer a relationship between that person's depression and their reaction to the error. And in fact, after exercise, a single session, there wasn't a physiological difference between the teens with and without bipolar disorder. So that's not to say that this is a, a vaccination and it's forever, but at least temporarily, about 20 minutes after the exercise is over, there's an effect that has a, um, what I would consider a normalizing, at least at a, a physiological level, between teens with and without bipolar disorder. So the natural question is, what if people's fitness gets better? Can this have a sustained effect? Could you appreciate these types of benefits throughout, uh, throughout the day or throughout the week? Another thing that we're interested in, you probably are not surprised to hear this, is blood flow in the brain. There's a number of studies in adults with bipolar disorder, not until this study, looking at cerebral blood flow. There's a number of ways to do it, some of which require uh, radioactive uh, isotopes uh, or injections, which we don't like to use in people that are 15 or 16 years old. And so we use an MRI uh, sequence which essentially puts a magnetic spin on your blood as it goes into your brain. And because of that magnetic spin, it's able to follow where the blood goes. And so in the study, what you see is regions in which teens with bipolar disorder had elevated blood flow compared to healthy teens. So we thought the opposite, because all the adult studies told us that adults with bipolar disorder have lower blood flow, especially in front regions of their brain, and especially when they're depressed. So that was our hypothesis, that the teens with bipolar disorder have low blood flow and that the exercise would increase their blood flow. So it turns out it's important to study teenagers separately from adults because they're different um, for reasons that I have not been familiar with, but it turns out that this is something that's well recognized, that there are developmental changes in the extent to which blood flows to your brain over different parts of the lifespan. But teens with bipolar disorder in any case had higher levels of blood flow in the front regions of their brain and middle regions of their brain, again, relevant to decision-making and to uh, mood processing. This was done in collaboration with uh, a medical biophysicist that works at Sunnybrook and a close collaborator, uh, Brad McIntosh. What did exercise do to the brain? We thought it would 
increased blood flow. In fact, it had the opposite effect. It had a reducing effect on cerebral blood flow, such that as we saw with the previous task, there was a normalization. So before exercise, there were significantly elevated levels of blood flow in teens with bipolar disorder. Afterwards, no significant difference in the same group. And what you can see here where it says A is regions in which the blood flow re reduced after exercise about 10 minutes after cessation of exercise, and B about uh, 25 to 30 minutes after cessation of exercise. So as you can see from the number of different regions, that impact gets broader in the brain as time goes on. And we didn't keep them in the scanner longer or bring them back after, so we don't know how long it lasts, probably pretty temporary. But the point being that it has a pretty diffuse effect. What was interesting here was if you looked at the drop in blood flow in the front part of someone's brain, the greater the drop for a teen with bipolar disorder, the more exhausted they were when they had just finished the exercise. So thinking back a few slides, remember that we asked them about their emotional experience and that one of the things related to energy. And those kids that felt the most exhausted having just finished exercise were the same kids or teens that had the most normalizing effect. So how can it be that something that takes a teen with bipolar disorder makes them look much more like a teen that's healthy, has a negative influence on their mood? Again, coming back to the theme of why they may not be exercising. Those kids who most stand to benefit if we're going to uh, make conclusions about this or, or forecast that, you know, if this is something that's borne out over other studies and other groups and it's a real finding, then we could say that this is something positive to have a reduced blood flow uh, to the brain after exercise. If that is having an effect that makes people exhausted and not want to do it, it's important for us to communicate to them that that exhaustion, which they experience as negative, may in fact be a reflection that something good is going on. Um, so my hope is that this type of data eventually will inform conversations that we have with people in terms of explaining how does exercise affect them. So I'm just going to uh, go through the next couple a little bit more quickly, but we're, these studies are looking more forward, and so understanding more directly the link between your heart and your brain. So what you see with these spikes is the difference in pressure as you have a heartbeat in different parts of the vascular chain leading from your heart to aorta and going farther and farther away, eventually into tiny blood vessels. And as you can see, and if you put your hand over your heart or you put your, hand, your fingers on your neck, you'll recognize that there's a, a significant pulsation every time your heart beats. But in the brain, there's protective mechanisms that keep the tiny and exquisitely sensitive blood vessels in your brain protected from these shifts in pressure. And that's depicted at the very end where you notice there's no more pulsatility on the right side of the figure. But as we age and as people get uh, medical conditions, you lose that protective effect. And even at those tiniest blood vessels uh, deep in your brain, there continues to be a pulsa uh, pulsatility when your heart contracts. So what we did was we looked at how the signal in the MRI while someone's in an MRI of the brain fluctuates in relationship to their heartbeat. So on the left, what you see is if you imagine you're lying in a scanner and we're looking at the intensity of the MRI signal as you're lying there, we hit a stopwatch and we do, as you can see here, 200 seconds. There's no relationship between the intensity of your MRI signal and time. So it's not something that tends to wax and wane in any predictable kind of way. But what if you look at it not in relation to time, but in relation to your pulse? So these same teenagers had a pulse monitor on and we were able to organize the data so that it looked at it in relationship to their pulse. And there what you can see is a very, very tightly linked relationship between your pulse uh, and the intensity of the signal of your MRI. So what that tells us is the possibility that heartbeats are in fact reaching the brain um, in a way that's um, potentially damaging over, over the long term. And it's not the case that exercise, for example, is damaging, but the vessels are getting stiffer and the signal of the pulse is, is hitting the brain in a way that uh, isn't ideal. And what we saw in this study is that the extent of that pulsatility, so the teens with bipolar disorder had a bigger shift than the healthy teens. And both the teens with bipolar disorder and the healthy teens had a drop in the intensity, so the extent to which a heartbeat caused a fluctuation in the signal dropped after exercise, but it dropped more for the healthy teens than it did for the teens with bipolar disorder.
This study, I wanted to point a couple of facts about. One is that it ended up being featured on the cover of our twice annual hospital magazine. And for reasons I think you can imagine, it appeals to your imagination. You look at this and, and what do you think about? Right? Is this an ophthalmology study? It looks kind of mysterious. And what it says is, do you see what we see? And what this is, is a study that we have started over the past three years and will continue doing um, for the next three to five years, looking at retinal photography. So looking at photographs of the back of the eye um, for the purpose of trying to understand mental illness. And the other picture that you see there is myself with my colleagues in neurosurgery, Dr. Yang, a neurologist, Dr. Sandra Black, who's a world-renowned uh, stroke and dementia researcher, and Dr. Peter Curtis, who's our head of ophthalmology. So this was a really kind of motley crew of investigators that came together for the purpose of understanding bipolar disorder, which to me is uh, a really neat part of, of work, is to be able to bring people who don't in their day-to-day -day life focus on teenage bipolar disorder, but are putting forth effort and the resource of their time on this topic. So this is the setup. Um, as you can see, there's a chin rest, and in this contraption is a digital camera. People get their eyes dilated, and then they get a photograph. And as you can see here, you can see that the retina, which is part of your central nervous system, it's a nerve that's um, got blood vessels that are thought to reflect the same types of blood vessels that exist in your brain. So there are differences between different blood vessels in different regions. And this is the closest you can get to actually taking a photograph of a brain blood vessel. And it has same embryologic or cellular characteristics. And because of this, we think that any insights we gain from understanding these types of blood vessels are going to be especially relevant for understanding blood vessels in the brain. Some of the vessels are thicker than others, and some are thinner. Some have thicker walls. And the bottom line is that with uh, several hours of training, you can get people uh, to be pretty reliable in terms of separating a tiny vein from a tiny artery and in terms of measuring according to a very specific instruction manual how wide these are at different points. And the bottom line is the relationship in the width of the tiny arteries compared to the width of the tiny veins has been linked in adults with your cognition, uh, your cardiovascular health, and even with mental health symptoms. So based on the first study that we published, we found that all of these factors only in teens with bipolar disorder, that these retinal vessels were correlated with their blood pressure, were correlated with their functioning of their blood vessels in their fingertip, and that's what you see in the scatter plot, that in the teens with bipolar disorder, the structure of your blood vessels in your eye are very strongly related to the function of the blood vessel in your fingertip, and we use um, a, a technology called peripheral arter arterial tonometry, so basically a uh, very sophisticated device that can look at the volume of each heartbeat that you have in your fingertip. And you can provide a stressor by um, putting a blood pressure cuff on and holding it for a couple of minutes and then releasing it. And a healthy blood vessel should expand. Um, but if it expands less, that's not as good. And what we see is those kids whose blood vessels didn't have that reaction that they're supposed to have were the same ones that had problems with their retinal vessels. You may be wondering what, you know, what this all means. What it means is that we're thinking about bipolar disorder not only as a disease that isn't just a mental disease but a brain disease, but also a disease that may be a multi-system blood vessel disease. It just so happens that it affects vessels in the brain earlier because the brain's exquisitely sensitive and it takes many, many more years for it to affect the heart. But this is something from the get-go, at least in teenagers with bipolar disorder, that may be something that's affecting the whole body. So again, circling back to the two themes of stigma and in terms of treatment implications, you can imagine how this could make a difference. And just to conclude, you know, this isn't something that we're the first to think about. There's a recognition. We really need to be bringing forward in time the link between medical care and emotional health care or psychiatric care. This is something that we think about when somebody's had a stroke or a heart attack. We get on board with treating their depression because we know it affects outcomes. But what about treating mental health and physical health in youth, looking at those outcomes in the future before they've happened? And with teens, you saw from that early slide, that Canadian population study, with the anxiety, with the depression, with the substance use, there's so many things to talk about at appointments that we often defer physical health, conversations about exercise. We worry about those conversations. Will it make the person feel bad to talk about quitting smoking and to talk about exercise? And I think part, then, the way to say that is it's a challenge. How do you speak about it in a way that doesn't make them feel bad? And one example uh, that I would offer is to separate the connection between exercise and weight and to focus more on cardiac fitness. 
because the fact is that if you exercise frequently, you don't need to lose a pound to benefit meaningfully from your heart's perspective. And in fact, it's a lot easier to get aerobically fit uh, through exercise than it is to lose weight. And so what I started to do clinically is, uh, you know, you still talk about physical activity and nutrition, but separate that idea that someone's got to work out in order to lose weight because it can be really demoralizing for someone who's got depression and medications on board that's really constraining uh, their ability to impact. So in conclusion, teens with bipolar disorder are, are at increases for heart disease for a whole bunch of reasons, and that's why the strength of the connection is so high. We know that risk factors for heart disease, like blood pressure or obesity, are already in teenagers with bipolar disorder related to their brain structure and their brain function, as you saw from their performance on tasks of cognitive flexibility. You heard that a single session of exercise can have normalizing effects from an emotional perspective, also from a physiological perspective. And so how do we use this clinically? Maybe it's something that we can offer to patients as a fact so that they know you don't necessarily need to commit to six months of exercise. Even a bout of exercise here and there could potentially help you on that day for a period of time. And I would offer the conclusion that this heart bipolar link offers a number of different creative ways that we can think about new biomarkers that'll help us understand the underlying cause of bipolar disorder. I think access to treatment is super important, but the reality is in modern times that even those patients that we see in subspecialized settings who are getting the best available treatment according to guidelines, who have access to psychotherapy, they're still suffering from symptoms a lot of the time. And so in addition to access, we still need research to get at fundamental biology and understand what's causing this disease and move towards treatments that get us not just better, but well, or get our patients well. Two slides on uh, f uh, forecasting the future. What do you see here? Colleagues of ours in anesthesia. And why are we working with them? Because there's this medicine called nitrous oxide. Who's had nitrous oxide in the dentist chair? A, a lot of folks, have, a lot of us have. Um, quite a safe medicine used appropriately at the right dose. And as it turns out, has antidepressant effects. Why am I interested in it? Because it's something that affects blood vessel flow, uh, blood flow in the, pr in the brain. So our thought is to use this as a medication or as a treatment, it's inhaled, to purposefully shift blood flow in the brain in a way that's normalizing. And that's something that I think in the next five years we'll, we'll um, have pretty substantial data on. Then the other is, and as you can see here, a theme in all of my work has been teams and collaboration and bringing together people that don't otherwise cross paths, don't even work in the same wing of the hospital. I won't go through name by name, but we have medical physicists, uh, radiologists, cardiologists, and all of them, all of the people that you see here, basic scientists, they're all co-investigators on a study that's looking at tiny blood vessel function and structure across multiple different parts of the brain and body in teenagers with bipolar disorder. And so as a next step, and I was talking to uh, colleagues here at the Royal, and I know that that work is also close to their hearts, looking at the relationship between brain and heart at a vascular level, and what you see in this uh, slide at the bottom is your heart's reaction to holding your breath. If you hold your breath, your blood vessels are supposed to expand in your heart and in your brain. And as it turns out, those are the only two places in your body that do the same thing. All the other parts of your body, when you hold your breath, they constrict. So isn't that fascinating? Um, at a vessel level, brain and heart are uh, our first cousins. And then finally to close on, on the issue of stigma. And what you see here is the heart bipolar theme is something that's uh, central to our clinical mandate and to our research mandate, but it's also central to our uh, stigma busting mandate. And I'll, and I'll read it for you. For those of you who have tried to use social media to put forward causes that you're passionate about, you know that it can be challenging to, to get traction. And this is from a few years ago at this point where we would post something, a uh, link to a great article, a fact, a, a mental health related public event, and we would get you know 10 people or 15 people viewing that link. And this one uh, got a thousand links and what it said, it's uh, I guess a launch for lack of a better word of an explanation for our icon, which is heart bipolar. And what it says is to us, the heart uh, not, only represents, um, not only represents dedication and care, but it is a symbol that bipolar disorder is linked to cardiovascular risk and affects uh, mind, brain and body. So the fact that that got so many, um, got so much traction at that time, uh, converges with my experience of working with patients and families, which is largely that people find this to be a normalizing, uh, normalizing connection. And hopefully tonight you've heard about why I think it could have benefits for people 
uh, in addition to alerting their attention to a very uh, a real situation that could arise in the future. Tomorrow is World Bipolar Day, so I think for those of you who don't uh, go on Twitter, Google it. There's a lot of great activity that happens in the world on uh, World Bipolar Day. And that day was selected because it's the date of birth of Vincent van Gogh, who's widely thought to have had bipolar disorder, uh, as are multiple of his relatives, as, uh, in fact. Last night, we had our annual public information event at the Center for Youth Bipolar Disorder at Sunnybrook. And one of the team members in our group, we, we always think, how can we make the event, like, how can we flesh it out more? So there's, there's presentations and there's research posters. And someone suggested, let's put out these stones um, and people can write on them words that are meaningful to them. And a father of a patient of mine took a, a photo of this and posted it on Twitter. And I put it for, uh, here for you with some of the words that are written on the, on the stones by these teens with bipolar disorder. I think as a concluding message to us, hope, create, research, explore, brave, no stigma, family, inspiration. What a great synopsis of all the factors that are important. So with that, I wanted to express my appreciation for our patients and their parents who have the courage to participate in this research for funding agencies who we've convinced to, to fund us for this, and our collaborators who, to their credit, were willing to take a risk because I can tell you that 10 years ago when I started talking about this topic, people thought that I was coming out of nowhere. Um, and it was a big risk for them to collaborate and it's really uh, to their credit that they agreed to and that we have all of the information that we have so far. And of course, the pleasures of working on a large team with young trainees in medicine and psychology and social work and pharmacology. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and for coming out tonight. Thanks.